We have uh, Joseph Hupp with uh, Jax. I'm, um, I'm from Northwestern University and from the Chemical Sciences and Material Sciences Division here at uh, Argonne. I um, have been at Argonne for about three years, but um, I was here before uh, I ever went to Northwestern. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I spent the summer here, and I think that's about the time when things crystallized that I decided I really research uh, on, on uh, fundamental science was really what I wanted to do um, for my career. And I don't know what your experience will be, but I found it tremendously positive. So I, I wanted to ask, how many of you are postdocs here? And some of you are staff members? A few. And how many are students? And there are probably some folks that are something else. I'm not sure what the fourth category is. OK. <laughs> So uh, Sarah asked me to talk about uh, some different uh, things than what um, Professor Popemeyer talked about. Everything that he said is, um, um, is, is, is essentially the same. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, about how to start a manuscript. And I'm not sure why Sarah asked me to do this, but I will tell you that the first 35 papers I wrote, so that's a lot of writing. I sweated blood. I found, found it very, very hard uh, to write the manuscripts. And it only got easier by just going through it, and somehow it just did get easier. But let me tell you what, what, I, um, what I do now as I work with my students. The, <coughs> the first thing to do is decide, well, what's the point that you're trying to get across? And it, sometimes it turns out that what you What's the important story to tell is not what you thought it was when you undertook the, the research. That may end up being rather peripheral, and you have to think carefully, well, what would be most important? If you try to convey three or four messages in one paper, it'll be confusing, and your idea won't uh, get through. So focus on one if you can. Then if you take the, take the figures that you think would illustrate the story in your paper, Put those together um, and pull the tables together and put them in the order that you want to, um, that you want to tell the story. Uh, then write a sentence that introduces that figure, then a couple sentences that explain it, um, and then a phrase that says, you know, now we should go look at figure two and explains how that first figure connects to the second one. So you notice that um, we, we didn't start with the introduction. Now, why is that? I think for, 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 at least for me, for the first 35 papers, maybe for the first 100 papers, the introduction was the hardest thing to write. It was the very hardest thing to write. So why not wait till the paper is all done, and then you know how, uh, how to frame what it is that you've written. Otherwise, you may sit for, if you're like me, you might sit for two days staring at the screen, and nothing gets written because well, you just don't like how it, how it turns out. OK. Um, when you've got all that done, write a paragraph that summarizes the, all the findings. It doesn't repeat everything, but just summarizes the, um, the high points. What you would like, and what I often do when I uh, look at papers, uh, and I need to look at a lot of them, is, well, is to go to the last paragraph of the paper and see what it is the author uh, told me. And then that uh, guides me on whether to read the paper or not. You present the main findings. And often, this is the place to say, well, you know, now that we've covered all of these things, I can draw this grander conclusion that I really couldn't draw when I was um, telling my audience what figure four means. And uh, sometimes, it's appropriate to say, well, here's, here's what we want to do next or here's what we are doing next. That takes care of the conclusions. Then um, go to the introduction. And so you want to say, here's the topic I'm working on. 
Um, here's why it's important. Um, you need to acknowledge who else is, um, not so much who else, but what else has been uh, done in this field. Uh, and, and sometimes people are afraid to do this. I, um, and and they, they think, well, you know, if I, if I point out that Professor Smith kind of worked on this already, my paper's not going to be accepted. Well, it might be true, it might not be true. There's a pretty good chance Professor Smith is going to read your paper and review it. Um, so just from a strategic standpoint, it might be a good idea to acknowledge um, uh, the work that Professor Smith uh, did. He might think more highly of your work if, uh, if you don't appear to be hiding um, uh, what it is that's already been done. And then at the, so how do you finish the introduction? You almost always can say, well, in the paragraphs that follow, we show that this main idea, whatever that conclusion is. And what, <clears throat> why do you do that? Well, you don't want to read four or five paragraphs trying to figure out what it, where is the author going? What is it that I'm actually going to learn if I read this? It should be at the, very, at the very latest, at the end of the second paragraph. If it's a full paper, then OK, at the end of the introduction, then that might be three paragraphs. But for communication, it should be the end of the first or second paragraph. OK, don't ever do this. Uh, start a paper with, it was a dark and stormy night, or uh, start it with in recent years. That, um, so why not do that? I, well, I don't know. I think it's the most irritating phrase in um, all of journaldom. Um, it doesn't really say anything. And it um, suggests that you haven't really thought about why it is that you're working on this other than that, well, somebody else was working on this. Sometimes, you know, you've worked hard on this research and you really start to get into detail about something. And it's fascinating to you, uh, but then you find it's tough to circle back and pick up the thread of the story again. So a, a strategy that often works is to take that, that point that really would be useful to someone who wants to drill down and really understand uh, this, and you just put it in the reference section as a, a paragraph of um, you know, a side note. It would be a sidebar if it were published in a, um, you know, in a non-scientific journal, in a magazine. And then you um, convey the information you want, but the person who isn't working directly in this field doesn't lose the train of the, uh, of the story by reading through that. You can skip over it. You can come back to it later. Um, okay. So, sometimes you still um, can't get started. So what do you do? You just put yourself in the frame of mind of writing things and so you write things that you don't have to think about how to phrase them. And the easiest thing to write is to write the acknowledgments. Doesn't matter how you phrase it and there are only about two or three ways to do it. So write that. Um, then you write the experimental section because it's just you know, it's cut and dried, and you don't have to think, how am I going to present this most persuasively? How am I going to make my argument? You don't say that. You just say, these are the instruments I use. This is where I bought the chemicals, and so on. But what you're doing is writing all of these things. Then go to the figures. Write the captions for the figures. If you're still stuck, well, um, <clears throat> go get um, a program like EndNote, if you can. Um, or just use the EndNote function in, um, uh, in Word, but EndNote library works better, uh, and, and start assembling the references that you think you are going to cite. And now, um, if you're really stuck, the right place to start is with the introduction. And where people often get stuck is they, they, they start to write a sentence, but they say, I don't really want to say it that way. I want to say it this way. And then they delete that, and they start again. Or at least this is what I do and, and many of my students do. So you decide at this point, I'm not actually going to write anything. I'm just going to make bullet points of what it is I am going to write. And I'll get them all down there. And I'll sort them later. I'll get them in the right order later. I'll just get them down uh, on paper. And then do the same thing with the results. 
and then do the same thing with the explanation and interpretation. And if you're still not in the, the swing of things, you'll go into the laboratory, do some experiments, then come back the next day, take each of those bullet points and write a, a sentence or two about it, and then you'll have a, a serviceable first draft um, at that point. Okay, so you get a lot of papers uh, at Jack's, and uh, about 700 of them come through the office in Evanston every year. It's a lot of papers. And uh, everyone who submits the paper um, feels that they really are reporting something new. And that, of course, is the case, unless they're plagiarizing. And I don't think we've, at least in the Evanston office, fortunately, we've never had a case like that. You can't publish a paper unless there's something new. But if you change propyl groups to butyl groups, and the solubility changed a little bit, and the reaction got faster, well, that's new, but it's not the new that JAX is looking for. It's not the new that inorganic chemistry is looking for either. So having a new result, often I, when a paper's rejected, a, especially newer authors will write back and say, but this is new. Nobody's done this before. And I, that's true of every scientific paper. Nobody did this before. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to publish it. And I think Ken and I have probably both had the experience of we're about to submit a paper and we find out in fact, that our results aren't new anymore because our, our friendly competitors just published exactly what we want to publish, and then we just have to ash can it. Um, but every paper has a new result. It's not an argument. So what you need for JAX is uh, a new idea, a new way of thinking about something, a, a new concept, uh, a new approach, not just a new example. This has been done with palladium, but never before has it done, been done with platinum. And look, it, it behaves a little differently. That's it's important to do, but JAX isn't the right place for that because an organic chemist doesn't care whether it's palladium or platinum, and a materials chemist doesn't. Only an inorganic chemist does, but the audience is very broad for JAX. Paper that puts out a proof of concept, that's, uh, that's very good, uh, and you, it doesn't have to be practical. You're putting the idea out there and if it's an attractive enough idea um, that it seems like others would end up exploring that, that would be, um, that's a very um, appropriate paper for JAX. Um, the paper has to report in advance that would be useful to other people in the field. And if the field is so small that you're the only person in it, probably you need to, um, need to switch to another field. You, often we get, you know, we're scientists and we get clever ideas. Those clever ideas are worth publishing, but not, not in JAXs. They won't be appreciated by um, a general audience. So you, you have to have an advance and not just um, uh, a clever insight. And the last point's important, and, and often authors whose papers are declined um, get very frustrated because the reviewers have said it's not of broad enough interest. And they're very interested in it. They're investing 50 or 60 hours a week in this. Uh, why wouldn't everyone else be interested in it? But you want to look at it from the perspective of would a biological chemist who's leafing through uh, Jacks and, you know, is broadly interested in chemistry, is there a chance that he would read my paper or she would read my paper about actinide reactivity. Well, it probably has to present a new idea or a new concept or something like that in order to pull in someone who really doesn't work in your field at all. And so the paper has to be written uh, not at the level of expertise that you would write a paper uh, for inorganic chemistry, but a, li uh, you know, a little bit broader than that so um, you know, the audience doesn't know what all the acronyms mean and what the jargon is and so on. Okay, so what don't we publish? I'll get a, a, a lot of, I don't know, maybe 15 papers a year. Someone writes in and they say, it's work that you, that you guys publish, that you editors let get in, completely wrong. And I have a paper that illustrates this. And by the way, don't send it to the original, uh, to the original author because he, uh, he's biased. 
so these turn out to be easy for editors at JAX to handle because we don't publish those types of papers. And it's a little bit frustrating be, uh, as an editor because more times than not, the, the authors write. They've found that, that, the ed, that the author messed up or we didn't do a rigorous enough job reviewing, and indeed the published work's wrong. That's not what general um, readers of JAX want to see. If you go to a journal like the Journal of Physical Chemistry, which publishes something like 40,000 pages a year, so there's lots and lots of science in there, they have a, a set-aside section where you can comment on someone else's paper and, and, and they can respond and then, uh, you know, back and forth to, uh, to clarify that, um, that this is uh, the case. But you can't base a paper for Jax on Smith didn't get it right. Now, you, you can describe something, present something original, and say, well, by the way, this shows that Smith isn't right, uh, and, th and that's why this is true, but that can't be the point of the paper. If you describe a new instrument or technique, Jax doesn't publish those papers. Um, I'm not sure why. I, I, I guess if I were an analytical chemist, I might be unhappy with that, but that's the case. Sometimes we get papers that just don't have much chemistry in them. They come from, um, typically from physicists or geologists, and to them it looks like there's a lot of chemistry, but, and they, so they want to put it in a chemistry journal, but it really belongs in a journal um, in another discipline, and maybe you know, a very prestigious journal in another discipline, but what you want to ask, um, Professor Popelmeyer touched on this, and what these authors haven't done is to ask, well, who is it that I want to read my paper? You can get obsessed with, well, I want it to be a journal with a high impact factor, or I want it to be this journal or that journal for whatever reason. What you really want to ask is, how am I going to reach the people um, that would read this? So um, oftentimes, we have work from my own lab that would fit in JFIS Chem. But I don't think the folks that are following that work read JFIS Chem, even if it's about physical chemistry. So we don't publish it there. We might publish in a journal that is not as highly ranked as JFIS Chem, but that's not the point to collect how high a ranking. Uh, the point is to find out, uh, to send the paper where you're um, going to find the right audience. Okay. Don't publish papers that are you know, mainly empirical um, and a collection of observations. Um, we publish things that are hypothesis driven and we don't publish papers that are really really good but they're not the very best papers and it's the the journal publishes about 20 percent of what it receives um, so it's, it takes a while to figure out how to do this uh, and there's some people that can get this right most of the time, so that means for most of the rest of us, we're not even going to hit the 20%. Uh, and we have to not take it personally. Uh, there are other general interest journals uh, besides JAX, uh, but that's what we have to do. I'm sorry? How does this journal compare with nature? Say that again. How does this journal compare with nature? Is it the same? Oh, well, so JAX is an Angavanti and chemical communications uh, and chemical science are all general interest chemistry journals. When you go to Nature, that's a general science journal. That's where you publish, a, if you're a chemist, you publish a paper that an astronomer leafing through this in his den, she'll say, oh, those chemists, they've done something that's pretty interesting. Okay. That's, the, that's the level of generality. Then of course it also has to be it also has to be um, important have some importance within the field of chemistry but also um, beyond it if if you're going to publish in Nature or Science and we all like to publish there um, Proceedings of the National Academy very prestigious place to publish um, but maybe not a very good place for a chemist to publish and why is that because chemists don't read that journal so. You have to ask, what is, your, what is your objective? Okay, so one thing, I'll tell you a few things that won't endear you to editors and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, Sarah asked me to do this, I'm not quite sure why, but um, indiscriminate submission. 
So if you keep throwing papers like plates of spaghetti against the wall, waiting for one of them to stick, it turns out that the, that's pretty tiresome. Um, and I, sometimes I think, you know, didn't we, haven't we rejected five papers from this group already this summer? It turns out the journal can tell me that. Um, and my thought is that if someone's sending 20 papers a year to JAX and getting no hits, they, they just want to waste my time. They don't want to, uh, they just are going for a stochastic uh, approach and hope that a couple of them stick. And then that makes me, in a borderline case, say, well, it's probably junk. I guess not. Uh, neglecting to, set, to, to cite work that's similar to your own, um, or, or, or to cite your own similar work. Um, so this is where you, you have this, and people, people do this, so don't do this. You have a terrific result for platinum, then you get a terrific result for palladium, and you send the platinum result to Angavanti, and you send the palladium result to Jackson, oh, you forgot to tell the author or the editors of the two journals that you did that. It turns out that's unethical. It's, if you read the guide, um, not only is it disingenuous, but it's unethical um, as the, 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 the guides to, um, uh, to authors describe it uh, in those journals. You have to include, just for the reviewers to read, related papers, let them judge. Maybe they're, they're so different that they merit being published um, you know, in high profile journals, uh, even though they're on um, similar topics. And reviewers, chemistry is a small world. I mean, there's thousands of chemists, but within a specialty, it's small. And I would say more often than not, authors get called out on this. And, that, and then that doesn't make the reviewer happy. Then they start reading it very critically and ask, well, maybe this person's putting something over on me. Did they do enough control experiments and, and, and become hypercritical? Um, certainly have to cite the work of other groups. Okay, with, with JAX uh, and other journals, don't come back to the uh, editor. Remember, the editor can only accept 20% of the papers. Don't come back to the editor and say, but I got three yes votes and one no vote from the reviewers. So you have to accept my paper. I mean, it's a democracy, right? Well, it's not. It's not. The reviews, they're just advisory to the editors. We could accept a paper where all the reviewers say don't accept it. And we could reject a paper where they all say accept. I'll get phone calls if I do that, but we could do it. And that uh, we've even talked uh, in JAX about doing away with accept or don't accept uh, because that's the, the authors, we all got, want to go read the score and see, am I in or am I out, rather than read the comments and see uh, what's there. Never works to say, but you published another paper, mine's better. It's a Gaussian distribution. And if your paper is better than the worst paper we published last year, we don't care. If you send the paper to Jax, chemistry's there's a lot of chemistry in modern chemistry, 24 editors. So it's, no matter how upset you get, chances are it's not even the same editor that handled the other paper. And then the third thing to remember is that what was news last year is now a confirming example this year. It's, it's not um, a, a new result anymore when you submit a similar paper. Okay, and here's one that uh, folks have a lot of difficulty with, uh, and it's, it's really frustrating. It takes 10 weeks to get your reviews, and there's only one. And the guide to authors says, well, you can expect two to three reviews. Every paper from the Evanston office goes to six reviewers on day one. And if we don't get, if we don't get some hits back within a couple of weeks, it goes out to another four. That's um, a lot of reviewing. If we only got one review back after 10 weeks, that almost always means there's not very much interest in your, in your paper. Um, so those, it, it, it's not that the editor was lazy. Could be, but I don't think that's the case. And uh, it's just that no one is very interested in it. Then that tells you that you failed the 
or I failed the, the broad interest test if it's my paper. Getting a rejection, I think the record is 10 minutes in my office for a, um, a indignant letter about the rejection uh, of a paper. You really feel indignant. It's like writing emails to, uh, uh, to your boss. You, you, know, you write them, then let them rot for a week, then go read them again, and then send them. Um, same thing with a, with a paper being rejected. If the reviewer didn't understand what you're saying, that's probably your fault. It means that most of the readers, if an expert didn't understand what you're saying, missed the point of the paper, you didn't communicate it very well. So that says, well, I, I, need, to, I need to get my idea across in a better way so even somebody that isn't an expert knows what I'm talking about. And then this is a difficult one. I just missed the bar. But I can fix that, and we can put another crystal structure in, and we can get more NMRs, and we can run more, one more kinetic reaction. And that'll get us from 89% uh, to a 91%, uh, or 79% to 82%. JAX doesn't accept borderline papers that get pushed up uh, over the bar. They, they just don't. I'm not sure why, but that's the policy of the, uh, of the editor-in-chief. Um, last couple things. You send your, edit, your, your paper to Nature or Science, and then you send it into JAX, and you might even forget the change in the text of the paper uh, that you're submitting now to JAX, and it says, here's why my paper belongs in Nature or Science. This happens about 15 times a year. Um, you don't have to tell the editor that you sent it to Nature or Science first, but chances are the paper's going to go back to the same folks, the same experts that reviewed it for science. And if you didn't address the objections they raised, then they're really going to be unhappy with you. When they see the paper the, same that's the second time, and they write in the note to editor, I saw this before, I wrote a three-page review, I put a lot of work in this, and the author ignored this, he just turned around and resubmitted it to you guys. And uh, finally, this last piece, um, if the paper is sloppy and it looks like you didn't care about it, then the reviewer won't take it very seriously. Or, and this, if, you, if English is your second or third language, it, it's useful to, to find someone whose English is their first language to copy edit it for you. Um, or if you can't, uh, to go to find a professional editing service. And we have a lot of terrific authors from Asia for whom English is their third language, and they use these editing services, and their ideas are conveyed much more clearly, um, and uh, that's really, in the end, what they want to do is communicate the science. Okay. Um, with JAX, you can't send the paper back in, hope you get a different... Uh, set of reviewers and a different editor, you are required to get the permission of the editor to send your rejected paper back in. And there has to be, you know, a really good reason. Well, we overhauled the study and we did another year's worth of work and now it's really very different. Would you consider it? Um, and then most of you won't do this, but you might after a while. It's very exciting the first time you get a paper to review to think, now I am a peer. I'm a peer reviewer, and um, often those reviews are very um, detailed and very diligent and so on. Uh, but eventually, you might fall in the category of, remember I said that we send the paper to six reviewers, and you know, maybe we get four back. Um, well, that means you really should review four papers for every one that you submit before you tell the editor, I'm too busy. I mean, we're all busy. Um, Okay, the last suggestion. Now, how do you get paper into JAX? It's kind of hard to do. Uh, and it took me quite a while to figure out myself how to get papers in. But what works sometimes, pick the author who you like reading her papers, read a couple of her communications in JAX, read a couple of her communications on the same topic in Langmuir or Journal of Biological Chemistry, and see how these differ, and then you'll get a sense of how the story's told for a general audience and how it's told for a bunch of experts. And you may find the expert written paper, if it's your area, 
to be much more elegant than the general one. Um, and that is often the case. So it's a mistake to think that because a paper is in JAX, it, it's a better paper than if it's in a divisional journal. It's, it's you're addressing two different uh, audiences. Um, and having said all that, even though it's difficult for us to publish in JAX, and the editor-in-chief, Peter Stang, likes to point out that his papers get rejected occasionally. I think I handle more of his papers than any of the other associate editors, so I, I know who he's talking about when he says his papers aren't always accepted. Um, but we still, we would like to publish the very best work. We'd like to publish your very best work, and we hope that you'll give us um, a shot at, at uh, having it reviewed and assessed and, um, you know, and, and showcasing it and publishing it uh, in JAX. Okay. I think I'm done. Great. Thank you very much. We have a question. Uh, yeah, one, one question would be, uh, what do you do when the editor rejects a paper just because he says, yeah, we cannot send the paper for reviewing because we get too much papers? Yeah, so, so Jax is, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're shooting for a third. And the, the reason is, I, I described that I, I have to send papers sometimes to 10 people to get two reviews back. Mm -hmm. And the proliferation of journals and publishing and so on, if I, if I read the paper and I know it's not going to make it, then, then we, we triage it. And the way to look at this, to not get frustrated, is to say, the editor just saved me six weeks. I need to submit this paper um, where it's going to be welcomed. So you don't think there's no point trying to argue with the editor, or maybe you should really send it to someone in case you are not an expert on the field? I well, you know, but I've probably looked at 6,000 papers. Okay. So you get, you get a feel for what is gonna, what's going to go and what isn't going to go, even if it's not your area. And the papers that get triaged is where you have those strong feelings. If you're not sure, mm -hmm. those are the ones we, uh, we send out. Uh, you know, having said that, um, most of the editors, if the, if the paper's coming from uh, a junior faculty member, the triage, uh, or a, a, a postdoc or a junior staff member, the triage letter might say, well, here's, here's really why it doesn't quite fit. Okay. Or, it, or it may send it out for review, knowing full well it's going to be rejected mm -hmm. because the feedback is useful to you to see what, you know, why the members of the community don't think it belongs in Jack's, belongs in some other journal. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Come back there. Yeah, thanks. Um, what, one question regarding to, like, figure out illustrations. Um, how... Um, y your opinion on like how detailed should be figures uh, submitted, because there's a l sometimes some figures can take a long time to like masonize, uh, yeah, the arrangement to to arrange that properly, etc. Um, oh, do you mean in 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 how to get how to start writing the paper? Yeah, and oh. start writing, but also then uh, like in order to make the paper appealing. So yeah. what's the what, what's your opinion on like how how detailed should should figures be submitted? Well, you want to get you want to convey the point clearly, and one way to confuse things is to put too much information in a figure. Um, we don't have a rule on figures, but um, advanced materials, for example, has a which is a great journal has a limit of five figures, and you see. Here's figure four, and there are nine panels. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't really convey very much, except that um, you know, it's just a lousy way of presenting things. The things that, are, that would interest an expert but aren't needed to get the point across, those you can put in the supplemental information. The more communications published in JAX, than full papers, but the lengths of communications counting supplemental information are, these days are typically longer than what full papers were 
you know, back in the day, back in the 20th century. Did, does that answer the question? Um, that it, it really takes a lot of time sometimes to um, think also graphically. I mean, text is one thing, but then portraying the information and also graphically sometimes it just takes uh, quite a bit of extra effort, which is which is okay. But then how much is needed, um, or how much is expected actually from from your side? Um, like for instance, mm -hmm. like Excel sheets. Um, or like Excel graphs, they look pretty simple sometimes, very mm -hmm. simplistic. Uh, is, is that uh, uh, like a no-no? Or uh, would you actually then perhaps also go later on in the, in the editing process well, and, and change those? You probably have to spend a, a, f a few hundred dollars on, on plotting and figure programs and rather than um, you know, the output from your, um, from your instrument. Um, and well, how much effort should you put in? I don't know. I mean, if you put too much effort in, then you're, you're, you're going to fall down on the point that Professor Popelmeyer raised, which is that I didn't quite put it this way, but we owe the taxpayers or the foundation or whomever sponsored our work to communicate our findings. And if, you know, if you're a perfectionist and you're publishing works of art as figures, so you publish one paper a year, then you fall down on that. I don't know where the compromise point is. You have to figure it out by experience. 